our final speaker of the day, Dr. Benjamin Hale. He is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and is also affiliated with the Environmental Studies Program at the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, he's also heavily involved in the Center uh, for Values and Social Policy there, uh, where he's a co-organizer of the annual Rocky Mountain Ethics Congress. He's also co-editor of uh, the really excellent journal, Ethics, Policy, and Environment, and vice president of the ISEE, which I mentioned before, the International Society uh, of Environmental Ethics, um, and also is the grandson of Nathan Mantell, the inventor of Mantell's test statistic, which is familiar to biostatisticians and ecologists. That's so funny. That's a, I, it's very few audiences in which I can say something about him. Uh, he is my he, he was my grandfather, and, and actually one of my first publications was his uh, obituary. So, which is sad, true, uh, but also an occasion for me to get published. Um, so, <laughs> was not. <laughs> I don't look I don't look fondly upon that occasion. Um, Okay, so first of all, this is gonna. This is Ron is a really tough act to follow. I have to say, uh, he gives such eloquent speeches. I, I feel I feel terrible, and I'm going to read some of this to you. And I, I will also say that I just pulled together this PowerPoint presentation pretty much this morning. Um, and, and really, don't think about the PowerPoint presentation as anything more than a distraction from what I'm saying. So you can kind of I'll let your eyes wander up here. Um, but I'm going to read this to you a little bit, um, and hopefully, I'll be entertaining enough that um, that you'll pay attention. So the title of this paper is Clowning Around with Conservation, Adaptation, Reparation, and the New Substitution Problem. I'll explain that in a moment. And hopefully in doing so, I'll be able to respond to the non-philosopher in the back uh, and the other woman who responded also to Ron with his discussion of uh, justice. And there were a few other people who were talking about uh, some of the justice arguments in Ron's talk. Um, it is a collaborative work that uh, that is coming out of uh, a little group that I run at the University of Colorado. I've written it with two grad students, Adam Hermans and Alex Lee. Uh, Adam Hermans, as it happens, was a master student at Otago for a while and worked with James uh, just over here. I only discovered this on the airplane. Uh, as, as it happens, James was sitting next to me on the airplane uh, flying in from uh, uh, Toronto. Anyway, so uh, here's what I'm going to do today. Um, I will do a little bit of chatting for a moment, um, and, then, and then, I'll, then I'll read this. So uh, I'll do the throat clearing first. I'll tell you about my, this kind of project that we're working on, this big group that I have. I'll tell you a little bit more about some other things that are going on at CU, and, and then I'll just go through the paper here. So there's an introduction, typically. I'll then talk about some value-based approaches to, uh, to um, conservation. Uh, I'll briefly go over the argument from reparation and the new substitution problem. Uh, fundamentally, I'll be looking at this kind of reparative justice notion that Ron was talking about, and in so doing, attempt to salvage the argument from reparation by basically recasting it as a different view than one that is typically interpreted, and particularly the one that Ron has presented to you, uh, hopefully hopefully offering up a different way in which you can think about why we might have an obligation to conserve, at least I'm not talking about de-extinction, uh, we'll then sort of get into a patch for future and then talk about some objections and concerns, so pretty straightforward. Um, but let me just do some throat clearing here. <coughs> that, that's all I had to do. That's not true. So I have more. I have more to do. So uh, so so basically, I uh, I'm a, one of the rare philosophers. I have a lab. Uh, the lab that I have is uh, not really uh, any kind of building, it's just my office, but uh, I, I have a couple of students who work with me. Uh, the lab is called the Committee on Environmental Thought, and we basically just think about stuff. Uh, we started a couple years ago, uh, and we've been working on questions uh, at the, at, uh, uh, that relate to intervention ecology, which many of you are familiar with. Um, this is kind of a new way of thinking about conservation. I don't know how new, but relatively new. Um, and, and the idea is, well, many of the restoration questions that we've been looking at in the past are also related to you know, future look, forward-looking questions uh, re regarding uh, climate adaptation and so on. So, um, so we have, over the course of this year, written a number of papers on the baseline problem, which is a sort of a restoration question, the substitution problem, another restoration problem, and then in this paper, and another paper on the new baseline problem and the new substitution problem, which are basically forward-looking questions. I'll explain those in a second, so don't worry about it. And essentially, we're looking at um, two different, at least very broad categories of uh, conservation uh, oriented around either compositions uh, of ecosystems or functions functions uh, of ecosystem, ecosystem functions. I want to mention also one other thing that I'm doing that's exciting that you might be interested in but has nothing to do with this talk. I'm just excited about it. Um, if you see me with the camera, this is why I have the camera. Uh, I, have a, I got a grant from, the, from NSF, the National Science Foundation of the United States, uh, to, uh, to, to, to work on basically one portion of this sort of large 
collaborative uh, project with uh, Northern Arizona University, University of Montana, and the University of Colorado. What we're doing in my group is we're developing 12 short um, films on the normative dimensions, the ethical dimensions of climate change. Um, if you're curious about this project, it's sort of just developing right now, uh, you can go to environmentalthought.com, you can read about my lab group and, and see the, the trailer. It's kind of fun. Hopefully, hopefully at some point we'll have, um, you know, the video's done. We got flooded during um, the floods uh, in the Front Range uh, just recently, and so the project has basically been put on hold for two months, and that's unfortunate, but uh, we'll get back to it soon, as soon as I'm done sheetrocking. Okay, so here we go. Introduction. Planning around with conservation, uh, adaptation, reparation, and the new substitution problem. I want to say one more thing. There is, in the book, there's an abstract um, that um, was, uh, it was initially written in um, first, uh, or, or third person. Um, we, uh, we, no, we, we, we wrote it uh, with a lot of, we, we, we say this and we say that and so on and so forth. And somebody went through and called it out and put it all in passive voice. I will say the abstract that's in the book is not one that we wrote, just want to clarify. Um, so, so in that it's passive voice doesn't really matter. Anyway, so here we go, ready? So here's the introduction. So, clownfish, we're talking about cuteness and charisma uh, once again. So colorful and charismatic, Tropical clownfish dart between sea anemones and coral like so many performers in an ocean floor circus. Partly thanks to their whimsy, the diminutive, the diminutive clownfish was vaunted in the 2003 film Finding Nemo, which one might assume would be enough to rally the people and save the fish. But the IUCN placed the clownfish alongside koala, ring seals, leatherback turtles, and six other charismatic species as one of their 10 flagship species likely to be affected by climate change. In the case of the clownfish, the reason for this loss is a combination of warming waters and ocean acidification, which affects the coral and the reefs in which the clownfish dwell. Uh, I shall, at this point, I feel like I should also apologize, as people have been doing throughout this event, and say, I'm not an ecologist. <laughs> so, you know, people are saying, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not an ecologist, so you can feel free to beat me, beat me up on the ecology. Anyway, so here's a problem. This is the problem. This is what I deal with problems. Uh, if clownfish are to survive, they may either have to be brought to less acidic waters with temperatures in their viable range, or the systems in which they currently thrive will have to be brought to a state that is more conducive to their survival. Moving the clownfish will, in turn, alter their new homes, ecosystems in which they otherwise do not belong. This has its appeal, but threatens to upend systems upon which many other sea creatures, sharks, rays, turtles, and so on, depend. Doing so, in other words, may save the clownfish, but sacrifice the system. Not moving the clownfish and restoring the system, on the other hand, is not really an option. It may well result not only in the death of the clownfish, but also potentially the total extinction of the reefs in which they dwell, as there can be no guarantees that the system is resilient enough to survive climate change and ocean acidification. Alternatively, one might either seek to recreate the ecosystem, perhaps by building artificial reefs and creating abiotic structures in which the same or a similar system might reconstitute itself, or one might roughly leave hardier elements of the ecosystem in place and introduce more resilient species that will assist in the survival of existing systems. One could, in the first instance, relocate everything, including the clownfish, and seek to adapt environments in this manner, <coughs> but this is a fairly unstable solution as climate change pushes background conditions into flux, suggesting that the whole system must perpetually be on the move. Or one might sacrifice a few individuals in order to generate a more robust ecosystem that can weather the coming storm. It would appear that there's no simple answer. Either the clownfish must be moved or some different reef system sacrificed and some different reef system sacrificed or the reef system must be moved and the clownfish sacrificed. No matter how one approaches the problem, the clownfish that inhabit the barrier reefs will likely be extinct in their native range. At this point, an ostensibly familiar conundrum arises. Ought we to prioritize the species or the ecosystem? Should we relocate the clownfish and thereby save the threatened species, but create whole new ecosystems to facil facilitate the long-term adaptation of flora and fauna in new areas? Or ought we to facilitate the adaptation of reef systems by instead introducing species and other interventions that will assist in the flourishing of what remains? The question is not only about what features of nature we assist in adaptation, but what successful adaptation might look like in the absence of a clear sense of what it would mean for these novel ecosystems to flourish. Generally, such a question is taken to be a puzzle regarding whether one can fix ecological systems by adding viable substitutes. So, for instance, whether ecosystem managers can substitute, substitute this is a terrestrial example, substitute in this case fences uh, for wolves in the management of elk. Let's call this the substitution problem. But there's a second aspect to this more familiar substitution problem that emerges in the face of global climate change and that is reinforced by the conclusions of resilience theory. Climate change will create no analog futures, ecosystems with no historical counterpart. For species level evolution to continue, we must either re relocate these species into like habitats that will secure their continued survival, or we must create new habitats for the most resilient species to proliferate and thrive. 
Failing this, we commit ourselves to allowing threatened species and ecosystems to disappear. In this paper, we suggest that climate change introduces a new problem for conservation, what we are calling the new substitution problem. This problem, we claim, is not easily solved by appeal to traditional value-based positions, but which seek guidance for action, I'm just throwing paper on the ground, which seek guidance for action, I didn't do that intentionally, which seek guidance for action by appealing to some individual or system of value. We argue instead that the new substitution problem can be overcome by appeal not to the value of this or that individual or ecosystem, but rather by appeal to justificatory standards set by a community of reasonable and rational affected parties. That's a little convoluted, but hopefully I'll clarify. We limit our discussion to the argument from reparation, which suggests that our obligations to assist in adaptation stem from a moral obligation to right prior wrongs. We do not aim to defend this approach as superior to other more common value-based approaches necessarily, that is, that we ought to protect nature because of its value, but rather only aim to explore this line of reparation reasoning. Not only is such reason common throughout the public policy discourse, as for example in the polluter pays principle, but, but it also illuminate, illuminates some of the shortcomings of more value-oriented approaches. Approaches, in other words, that suggest that the problem with environmental changes is that something of value has been lost or degraded. For the purposes of brevity, we only tangentially discuss matters of value of species and moral status. Our claim, rather, is that the argument from reparation gets off the ground not through the generally presumed line, that is, that one must repair damages or harms caused to victims, so this is actually the line that Ron was presenting, but rather that it rests on a prior failure of one to justify one's actions. As we have in other work, we argue that obligations to aid and assist species and ecosystems in adaptation, in particular, follow from a failure to justify, either by absence or neglect or omission or malice, actions that caused or coalesced to cause climatic change. This position, we believe, effectively recasts the climate adaptation question so that it no longer depends on the identification of ecosystem value, thereby obviating the new substitution problem and salvaging the argument from reparation. So just to recapitulate, to put this more succinctly, the challenge for our paper is to address the new substitution problem, which we think is novel and, a different, and different than the old substitution problem. Our thesis, however, is that the argument from reparation, which is but one of several adaptation arguments, ought not to be understood as an argument to make whole again, so much as an argument to justify. We argue this position by deploying a substantive case, right, the case of the clownfish, though any case in which the value of an ecosystem or of an individual or a system is said to be conserved through the various interventions currently under discussion in the new literature of intervention ecology will serve equally well. So, part three, which is really part two. Nemo no more, value-based approaches to intervention. Since, and this will be a little bit of recapitulation for you anyway. So, so since the 1980s, coral bleaching has been recognized as a growing problem in the tropical and subtropical seas. Climate change affects not only the atmosphere, but also oceans in a way that directly threatens the survival of coral and reef ecosystems. <coughs> as atmospheric carbon increases, coral growth sharply declines because carbon precipitates out of the atmosphere and accumulates in the oceans, thereby changing the pH of the water. In some places, this has already resulted in large-scale die-offs and loss of coral, which in coming decades is likely to grow worse. Exacerbating matters, as the water warms and the currents of the ocean shift, some flora and fauna populations shift as well, proliferating in otherwise unfamiliar environments. As ocean acidification drives changes and losses in coral reef ecosystems, reefs will undergo significant changes in biodiversity and species composition. Such shifts in the ocean environments may force reefs into novel configurations with a composition new to an area, much of which is a consequence of human activity. Anthropogenic climate change thus presents a principal hurdle for the conservation and restoration of reef systems around the world. Partly in anticipation of climatic threats to reef ecosystems, but also in response to bleaching and coral loss due to other anthropogenic causes, some nations, particularly those dependent upon ecotourism and coastal fisheries, have initiated efforts to promote the artificial generation of reefs. Governments and private actors alike have dumped objects, such as tires and tanks, into this, onto the seafloor in an attempt to both, both to dispose of unwanted material and to manufacture reef systems. The hope is that valuable aquatic creatures like clownfish might then continue to inhabit the same waters and regions, but live among artificial reefs. Right? So, in 1985, for instance, the United States adopted an unofficial, an unofficial uh, national artificial reef plan. The plan states that while the majority of reefs have been built to support and enhance recreational fishing, interest is growing in using artificial reefs to restore, mitigate, or create habitat, to improve recruitment and enhance juvenile survival and growth of reef-associated species. Some evidence even suggests that larger artificial reefs are more stable than some natural reefs. 
Perhaps as climate-driven changes in the ocean threaten the existence of natural coral reefs, artificial reefs could provide a means, as the National Artificial Reef Plan suggests, to assist in the adaptation of these systems. Many of the objectives of the reef plan, in fact, reflect lofty environmental goals, justifying construction of the reefs by appeal to the value that will be preserved or conserved. Reef ecosystems have been and will continue to be damaged by ocean acidification, and in light of this potential value loss, the claim is that we ought to do something to preserve whatever, we've, whatever value we can. On its face, this is a problem about value. Less reefs equals more value. Many familiar arguments for conservation appear to follow naturally from this line of thinking, right? And I think actually the way that Ron characterized the argument for reparation and even restitution and ends up his conception of justice also is very much contingent upon this value conception, but, but I'll let him speak to that maybe later. So, but there are problems for this value-based approach, as has been pointed out by numerous other environmental authors. And I'm thinking here of some of the restoration uh, the restoration ethics uh, work coming out of uh, you know, Robert Elliott and uh, Eric Katz and Andrew Light. So while creating an environment for more fish certainly creates more value, mostly of a homocentric sort, provided by the mere presence of fish, the creation of an artificial environment, according to some ways of thinking, like Elliot's, does not provide the same non-homocentric value as that held by a lost natural system. This problem of lost value is particularly resonant in a world with novel ecosystems. There's no present analog for a reef made of tires. As Elliot might put it, there is no value at all in these novel ecosystems precisely because they're so artificial. Further, there's no standard on which to assess norms like the health, diversity, and function of such a reef because such a reef is entirely new. If one buys the line that we're now living in a new era, the same may be said of most ecosystems in the Anthropocene. Part three. It's tough when you add an extra opening. The argument from reparation and the new substitution problem. So the presumptive argument in favor of climate adaptation, therefore, is that some ecological value must be conserved in the face of threats to that value. So for instance, one might argue that the clownfish ought to be protected because it is intrinsically valuable, or because it brings whimsy to the oceans, or because it delights children, or because it is beautiful, or integral, or delicious. Certainly, these sorts of value-based arguments can go quite a distance in advancing the case for conservation and adaptation. There are, however, many other ways to justify adapting a species or an ecosystem to climatic change as well, not all of which depend on making the case for lost value. One of the more prevalent is the argument from reparation. Consider this. This is what I'm calling the AFR, the argument from reparation. Because climate change and the consequences stemming therefrom is a predicament of our own making, we have an obligation to assist nature with adaptation. In instances of climate change, the AFR is sometimes referred to as the causal argument, though it has multiple instantiations and appears uh, throughout the literature. The idea here is that because anthropogenic drivers are a primary cause of climate change, and humans therefore have an obligation either to address damages stemming from climate change or to justify the causes and consequences of climate change. In instances of restoration, which is where one more frequently encounters the AFR, the argument provides the justificatory source of the obligation. The reason why we should restore an ecosystem is to right a prior wrong. Inasmuch as the AFR relates superficially to the reparation of lost value, it, would, it too would appear to be a value-based proposition. Given the value-based interpretation of the, F, the AFR, of which we're critical in this paper, it would, be an import, it would be important to identify not only the baseline state of affairs prior to the occasion of damage, but also to specify what component of the ecosystem was damaged and how such repair might proceed. In the case of reef, con reef conservation, this is an ongoing and complicated discussion. Once one has identified this damaged or degraded component, say for instance that a species like the clownfish is missing from a system, this generally isolates the source of lost value. So for instance, sea anemones are said to be important to reef ecosystems because they provide a home for clownfish and other reef dwellers. If they are missing or damaged or threatened, if in other words they are functionally extinct, their value to that ecosystem is thereby absent. Would that this component be replaced in some way, then the value of the ecosystem might then be repaired, or at least so goes the reasoning. But two challenging problems stem directly from this value-based reasoning, the baseline problem and the substitution problem. The baseline problem uh, poses a challenge to those who hope to restore an environment back to its pre-degraded state. There are obvious complications with, the, with identifying the baseline prior to which the ecosystem was not was uh, prior to which the ecosystem was not damaged. I'm not going to cover those here, um, but we do in, in other work. Um, the substitution problem, by contrast, raises a question about whether, in fact, a value can be restored to a system simply by substituting a component part and replacing it with a functional component that restores health or function to that system. That is, can you return some component from functional extinction by introducing a substitute? So this is what we're calling the old substitution problem. 
The classic version of the substitution problem is primarily a problem for restoration ecology, as I said before, since it is backward looking, directing its focus to a prior state of the universe in order to determine how a wrong should be rectified. When intermingled with irreversible climate change and the question of adaptation, however, the problem faces yet further forward-looking considered complications. Climate change introduces, introduces the objection that under no circumstances will we ever be able to save the ecosystem, and that even if we save some component of that ecosystem, we will be forced to sacrifice other systems in order to do so. Since we will never be able to save a system, one might assume we cannot possibly have an obligation to do so, and I believe people actually argue this, right? We just can't save the Earth. In the past, so we have to sort of decide what kind of world we want to live in, right? So you get this kind of like out of Emma Maris's work. <clears throat> in the past, when we've looked at questions of environmental restoration, our concern has been primarily about how to make an ecosystem whole again. But assisted colonization and assisted migration introduces a new twist on the old substitution problem. Not which ecosystem component can be swapped out, but rather whether the value of either the parts or the whole can be maintained in the face of variable environments where the old substitution problem seeks to restore value or make nature whole again by swapping out parts, the new substitution problem seeks to maintain value or adapt the whole by substituting some parts for others. This is a unique and new conundrum brought about by climate change. I mean, it's arguable, but this is, uh, we think since it's affecting the whole system, I think Ron said something to this effect as well. I'm cribbing a lot from Ron, you've noticed. Um, he's an important figure. Anyway, so uh, suppose we favor the substitution approach to adaptation. As we substitute uh, threatened natural with resilient artificial systems and provide a fertile environment for species to take root in novel locations, some species will thrive and others will struggle. Such colonization will occur somewhat haphazardly as the waters stir and the genetic bins are shaken. So some reef species will become dominant and others will fall away. There is, of course, a small likelihood that the distributional composition of the entire reef system will be the same, but if so, such a distribution will in fact be accidental. On the other hand, should we choose to rescue the most vulnerable reef species and relocate them to new environments, this will in involve introducing non-native species into an environment where they have not before been. So Ron, I should also say, I keep bringing him up, but Ron, before uh, this talk, I was not planning to give a PowerPoint presentation. Ron was insistent <coughs> that I give, uh, it, uh, let me put it this way, uh, I very typically give what are known in philosophy as intuition pumps, so I very often will use an example of Smith says what, and Jones says something else, and um, Brown says a third thing, and so on. So imagine, consider all these different situations. Ron was insistent that I have some kind of intuition pump in my talk, because I think he's never attended one of my talks in which I don't give an intuition pump. So I've created one for Ron. Um, so, so for instance, substitution-wise, suppose Ron, consider the following, Ron seeks to restore the whimsy of the clownfish. In lieu of clownfish preservation, he decides, he supports the idea of adding clowns to the ocean. This would appear to be, at least my intuition is, this will not suffice. That's the extent of my intuition pump, that was for Ron. Okay, so uh, when it comes to novel ecosystems, however, we do not have the epistemic luxury of evaluating the bites. But can you imagine scuba diving and then seeing a bunch of clowns, like freaking, it's crazy. So uh, when it comes to novel ecosystems, we do not have the epistemic luxury of evaluating the vitality of the ecosystem. We have only the individual components to evaluate. Do the components work? Or perhaps, do the components work well together? What is on the table with regards to the creation of new artificial reefs is not merely a matter of assisted relocation, but whether the formation of entirely novel ecosystems is a de desirable ecological objective, and whether, more importantly, it can be justified by appeals to reparative obligations deriving from the AFR. This problem is therefore a bit different than the problem of relocating a single species in order to ensure the long-term survival of that species. The new substitution problem clearly builds on the old substitution problem, and in that both involve prioritizing the value of either the system or the components of the system and ensuring that they function together. Where the old substitution problem seeks primarily to restore ecosystem function by swapping in functional, functional replacement parts, however, the new substitution problem is considerably more piecemeal, seeking to maintain value by putting pieces together in whatever way that works. Since we cannot know with any certainty what role substitute components will play in the formation of new environments, or whether and in what respects the substitute components are maintaining value in a system that otherwise would not exist, we cannot know whether the system is working. That is, we cannot know if we have maintained or preserved value. The universality of climate change places us on a counterfactual trajectory, on a path toward a state of the world that will be radically different than it ever has been. As a consequence, we can never restore natural systems to their original state, but will always forever be adapting them to new climatic states. 
This new substitution problem poses a potentially crippling challenge to arguments for adaptation that conceive of our obligation to assist in adaptation as emergent out of a responsibility to right the wrong of climate change by undoing the damage. In other words, if one approaches the AFR from the vantage of value or damage, then the new substitution problem leaves conservation with few options, right? We might just throw up our hands, right? After all, if reparation applies only to individual members of an, a species or an ecosystem, and it is they who are wronged by being displaced, then what possible reparation obligations could we have to an entire ecosystem? Does our ethical stance, therefore, regard, uh, with regard to climate change boil down to value, to context, to stakeholder interests? Not necessarily. One might be driven to any of these value-based conclusions, but we aim to suggest here that there is a third way to determine what our obligations to nature are. In this case, remember that we are looking primarily at obligations of reparation, which we take to stem from prior degradation. We think rather that obligations of reparation have more to do with the degree of anthropogenic complicity in the bringing about of novel ecosystems than with a destruction or degradation of value. In particular, we think that the, the degree to which we establish such complicity depends strongly on the extent to which ecosystem regarding practices speaking on behalf of initially damaging the ecosystem have been justified or can be said to be justifiable, which we're construing in very roughly speaking here Habermasian or Scanlonian terms. And I'm not really going to get into that because that's kind of crazy. There's a great deal more to say on this pragmatic conception of justification and justifiability, and unfortunately too little space in this paper to address this complicated topic. The short version, however, is that the complicity of actors in bring in, in excuse me, the complicity of actors in taking unwarranted and unjustified actions generates the obligation to repair damaged ecosystems. If some yokel throws a stick of dynamite off a party boat in order to catch fish, and in so doing destroys a reef, it is his recklessness that forms the foundation for his obligation to repair the reef, not necessarily the loss of value in the the reef. It is justifiability, in other words, not some feature of the ecosystem or component of the ecosystem that is the driving force in determining the value or the disvalue of reef, reef ecosystems. When we go through the process of insisting that we must conserve an ecosystem, we do so not within the context of a wider discussion about whether prior destructive actions were taken for good reason. We do not, for instance, seek to restore forests where our lively active cities currently stand. We do not, to take another instance, seek to return predators and disease vectors to our school zones. This is because whatever values these individuals or systems carry is partly predicated on the idea that such values have not been previously considered or taken into account. And more importantly, the conversation is not limited to value. There are also deep and challenging questions about rights, virtues, freedoms, consent, trespass, and so on, some of which are, ad are adequately captured by limiting, or, uh, limiting the discourse to value talk, or adequately left out uh, by limiting the discourse to value talk. We think not only that our view cuts more nearly to the core impulse of restoration ecologists, that is, what really bothers restoration ecologists and environmentalists about ecological degradation is that so much of it is pointless, senseless, and reckless, but also that our view elides problems like the new substitution problem. And we have to have done two things in this section. First, to introduce a new variation on our old problem, and second, to argue that ecological reparation is best understood as not as restoring function or value to an ecosystem, so much as rectifying past actions by returning the world to a state that affected parties can agree addresses concerns that were otherwise ignored, neglected, or denied. So here's part four, uh, Patchwork Future. Uh, so coming to the end, in a way. It's okay. So the simple fact about ecosystem management nowadays is that there is enough scientific know-how and economic wherewithal that, given enough good reason as well as enough money and time, we can manage known systems reasonably well. If someone somewhere chooses to introduce a species into an ecosystem in order to save that species, dedicated ecosystem managers can likely make it work. Indeed, a species may well thrive in its new ecosystem, and the ecosystem may be none the worse for its substitute inhabitants. <coughs> Unfortunately, where this has worked in the past, it is impossible to know if it will work in the future. Due to ecosystem novelty, ecologists will have little to no idea whether the system itself is thriving. A parasite, might thrive in its a parasite may thrive in its host, for example, but this relationship can be understood as parasitic only if there is a prior model of a healthy host. Indeed, fabricating a novel ecosystem in order to save a species does little more than loosely patch together an organic system that works, that resembles nothing like ever before, that privileges some choice species over others, simply because someone somewhere has selected the component species as worthwhile or valuable. We can indeed cultivate parasites by putting them in fertile hosts, but if we do, we are selecting those parasites as worth cultivating. We began this paper with a discussion of the new substitution problem in relation to clownfish and coral reefs, and so we shall end it. 
If we seek to address the problem of species loss by fabricating entirely new ecosystems, we do so at the risk of accelerating the consequences of climate change rather than thwarting the impacts of climate change. That is, we commit the same mistake that got us into this mess in the first place. As the climate changes, so too will our ecosystems. When we change them too, we accelerate this process. Moving ecosystems in order to save species is not simply like putting a bunch of flora and fauna in an environment in which they might thrive, like choosing houseplants for our living room, but rather creating inter interdependent systems from whole cloth, the smooth functioning of which we shall have little clue how to measure. Because climate change will alter the global environment, displacing species, fundamentally changing ecological relationships, and in many, if not most cases, removing the possibility of rest restoration, assistive adaptation may indeed be required. But if it is, it will have to be justified in the right way. What this means is that we will have to ask ourselves not what valuable things in the world we must preserve, but re rather what sort of world we, now and in the future, could accept as reparation for our wrongdoing. Our thesis provides a rationale for understanding obligations stemming from anthropogenic degradation as duties of reparation. We avoid the, the new substitution problem by emphasizing the justifiability of actions and not the value of this or that species or ecosystem. If it is true that we are morally culpable for the environmental changes underway, and we believe that we are, we propose that our culpability rests in a repeated failure to justify our consumptive actions and the losses associated with them. Not all of our actions, to be certain, but many of our actions. Our enormous cars, our giant homes, our coal plants to keep our shopping malls lit at night, and so on and so on. And not all of us, to be certain, but many of us. The approach we offer suggests that our responsibility to the non-human world now and in the future hangs on the unjustifiability of our actions today. It is thus independent of such historically contingent views of the natural. In order to right these wrongs of justification, we must ensure that all, for, that, that all adaptation activities of reparation be justified by appeal to what affected parties could accept as reparation, and that all further forward-looking actions be directly justified simpliciter. This will require, then, that all affected parties, experts, citizens, stakeholders, proxy representatives, work together on an ad adaptation strategy. Only an, an open, deliberative framework can lay the groundwork for a fair and just adaptation. We cannot pr proceed with a patchwork notion of this valuable piece, of this valuable piece here and that valuable, val valuable piece there. Assisted colonization or managed relocation will require revisiting historical paradigms and presuppositions, both within ecology and within ethics. Ecological restoration uh, to a previous natural state is impossible without turning, the back, turning back the clock on climate. And even then, it's, it's arguably impossible. <clears throat> Which is to say, barring some extraordinary geopolitical upheaval, it is virtually impossible. Therefore, our obligations can only possibly be fulfilled by ensuring that assistive measures that we do take are justified. For some threatened populations, assisted migration may present the only reasonable means to ensure the survi survival in the face of extreme climate change. Objections to these efforts include concerns that such actions will create unnatural novel ecosystems. We think that such concerns are a distraction. One of the primary arguments as to why we must preserve or restore an ecosystem like the reef or assist in the adaptation of, the species, of a species like the common clownfish is because climate change is, for the most part, anthropogenic. If the argument from reparation is the source of the obligation to assist, then, then it would appear as though we are saddled with a new substitution problem. But we have sought to argue that this needn't be so. So here's some real quick objections. I don't know how quick it'll be. Um, the preceding analysis raises several potential objections. For starters, we, some might disagree that the argument from reparation offers a compelling reason to assist in the adaptation of non-human species and natural ecosystems. We contend that the argument from reparation offers perhaps one of the strongest reasons to do so. If ocean acidification is one of the leading causes of reef degradation and clownfish loss, and the primary source of this degradation is anthropogenic climate change, then this would seem to amplify our obligations to assist in the long-term viability of reefs or clownfish. How strong, after all, are our obligations to artificially reconstruct ecosystems or conserve species if a tsunami or a volcano or an asteroid destroys them? In such cases, we require different reasons to justify intervention. Inasmuch as the human community has brought about climate change, many are of the mind that this same community bears additional obligations to reduce the harm stemming from it. At least in the environmental literature, the argument from reparation in the guise of the polluter pays principle or some related you break it, you buy it formulation serves to strengthen the obligation for forward-looking conservation in the face of climate change. Certainly, uh, following Sandler's arguments against species value, it may, the AFR may be the only reasonable position standing. Others may worry that without value or function to support the conservation of a given ecosystem, conservation priorities become arbitrary. Why, for instance, ought someone care about the clownfish and not the sea slug? Our position is that a robust deliberative process both can and ought to provide a reflexive check on such decisions. 
In the case of the clownfish, the IUCN, as a proxy for the international community, has established the clownfish as a species worth preserving. There are many reasons, no doubt, for such a designation, including its cuteness and caprice and whimsy, as well as perhaps it's important to the health of the reef ecosystem. But it is also worth noting that further scrutiny of such factors may lead to dramatically different conclusions, like that under somewhat more dire circumstances, we ought to let the clownfish go extinct. This is that triage discussion we were having earlier. So long as such reasons are subjected to the scrutiny of an evaluative pub public, and so long as there are no perversions in the process that might distort informed decision making, the problem of arbitrariness can be avoided. Some still may, some may, some still, some further may object. So, so something here that I should follow. So some may object that such a deliberative approach is morally thin, and that our solution only sidesteps, but th does not avoid issues of value, considerability, and so on. This objection relies on an intuition that with only a procedure to guide decision making, bad reasons may proliferate and be used to justify bad actions. We readily admit that this is a conceivable implication of our view. However, provided that the justificatory process is open and honest, provided that the procedure leaves space for revision, we trust that better solutions and actions will emerge from the ongoing dialogue. Still others may yet object more pointedly that a deliberative approach simply punts on the question of value, and that once one enters into discourse, the question of value will once again rear its head. But consider that if the problem of, problem of environmental degradation is not in fact a problem of communities or individuals neglecting to value an individual or an ecosystem, <clears throat> but rather a problem to, of failure to justify actions, then this is not at all punting on the question of value. Two things must be said here. First, the question of whether a species or ecosystem is valuable is relevant only if the problem of environmental degradation is a problem of failing to acknowledge value. Many people value things in the world and yet act recklessly toward them. They may, for instance, take risks with their health or their loved ones, even though they value these things immensely. Such decisions are undoubtedly characterizable as failures to value, but the fact that environmentally destructive behaviors are often more aptly characterized as reckless instead of evil suggests that degradation is at least sometimes not a problem of value. Second, in these instances minimally, and perhaps in many more instances maximally, if deliberative scrutiny insists upon and a process established for evaluating the strength and weakness of various relevant reasons is secured, this can assist tremendously in preventing such reckless actions. The extinction, the extinction of the clownfish due in no small part to damage caused by climate change, which we take to be a consequence of many millions of reckless actions coalescing into one catastrophic climate outcome, would thereby be only more ju morally justifiable if good reasons either for allowing the clownfish to go extinct or somehow for causing climate change in the first place could be defended. Such an approach therefore does not sidestep other issues like that of value entirely, but insists upon discursive engagement over how to proceed. Oh, that's Nima. This is my conclusion. So any number of reasons might suggest that we ought to assist in the adaptation of nature as a means of preservation. Nature is valuable, it is beautiful, it is important to us. Beyond this, the clownfish has a particular value as a flagship species for the IUCN. It is a cultural as well as an economic resource. At the end of the day, if the clownfish go extinct, human actions will be at least res responsible at least in part for this remarkable species' disappearance. What it means to repair the damage under these cir circumstances is what, is what is cast into doubt by the new substitution problem. The AFR, we hope to have shown, avoids the new substitution problem by casting adaptation as a problem of justification rather than of lost value. Our thesis in this paper and elsewhere is that obligations of reparation require the scrutiny of reason from a wide deliberative community of affected parties. They are not limited to the promotion of value or the prevention of disvalue. Reparation of adaptation through, or excuse me, reparation through adaptation may not necessarily require that we construct artificial reefs to replace those lost due to ocean acidification, nor does it necessarily specify prima facie and that we, uh, that we ensure the long-term presence of clownfish in our oceans. Any obligation that we may have to promote the reef, de reef development or assist in the migration of clownfish must instead be understood as derivative entirely from the conclusions of reasonable and rational deliberation on how, about how best to right the wrong. Perhaps then, an, an open and honest justificatory process can provide the necessary procedural guidance for conservation to be successful in the face of climate change. What conservation will ultimately look like will depend in large part on the decisions emerging out of such a justificatory process. Many conservationists, of course, are already engaged in such a process. But such efforts has, have either tended to seek a rigid middle ground, a compromise solution uh, between those who prioritize the species, the ecosystem, or both, or they've been perverted by various other political and economic factors. In the case of the clownfish, as we've said, conservation may well involve assisted migration, replacement, or artificial reef construction. 
though a value-based approach may be obstructed by the new substitution problem and reject artificiality and infringement on natural systems, we hope to have shown that many of the proposed adaptation approaches may be reasonable in certain conditions. An obligations-based approach, as, as opposed to a more value-based approach, can provide a more fruitful foundation for the practice and policy under which modern ecology and conservation management is, is, already, operating, uh, is already operating. Put a little differently, the argument for reparation does not fall victim to the new substitution problem precisely because the new substitution problem is couched in a presumption about what morality demands of us. The presumption that morality demands that we promote entities of great value or that we respect entities of moral worth promises to derail the argument for reparation. Instead, we have suggested that the argument for reparation relates fundamentally not to reproduction of lost value, but instead to the failure of human actors to adequately justify their past actions. That's that. Okay, we'll open the floor to questions now. So did Ron tell us that you needed something to um, be good to, like you justice had to be to an individual to or the relative of an individual or there had to, there had to be some, there was some discussion about who, who yeah, we have right. the obligations to. So did you say that we had under the AFR an obligation to assist nature? And uh -huh. if you did say that, did you yeah. mean it? And if you meant it, does that mean that you and Ron disagree on this particular philosophical point? We do, we do disagree on this particular point. Uh, so but with regard to whether or not we have an obligation to other entities or whether or not there, uh, there are entities that have a claim against us, that, that was, I think, specifically um, Ron's, uh, Ron's take on restitutive justice, right? And the idea was there that, um, and, I, and Ron, you can jump in if you feel so, you're pretty far back there. But, um, uh, yeah, it was this take on restitutive justice. And the idea was basically that, you know, if I have an obligation and I have an obligation to something that may make a claim against me, right, and I can, rest, I, I can, I can restitutively restore, like, a, a repair the harm to that victim. And in the absence of victims, that was his claim, in the absence of victims, I just simply can't do that. And species are not the kinds of things that could be, that have a claim against us. Right. Um, the second, the very that's that was the first that was his first point on justice. Then he came sort of came forward with this, the second point on re reparation, which is sort of the direction that I was going. And in that instance, um, I believe I have little notes here. Uh, he said um, that you don't necessarily have victims, right? Um, that there are some conceptions of reparation that don't involve necessarily um, directing uh, directing harm to to victims, um, but rather um, just acknowledging what you've done. I believe this is a more sort of virtue oriented conception of reparation. Do I have that right? You're understanding. Yeah. So um, that's one way of construing reparation, and um, and certainly one that's defended uh, in the literature as well. And I'm taking yet a third approach to reparation. I don't believe necessarily that um, that um, in order to commit wrongs, uh, one has to have a victim, so to speak, or that there has to be an entity that can claim that it has been harmed or has a claim against me. Right. Rather, I think that what constitutes a wrong environmental wrongdoing um, is that my my actions. Um, or are un, have, have not sort of been justified, where justification, right, is a, is, a, is, a, is, a pros, is a process, a process of justifying or making appeals to other, other uh, either like-minded or rational or reasonable parties who can evaluate the claims, right, that, uh, that, that support my actions, that presumably I've endorsed in order to take the actions, right? So, I don't know, am I answering your question? <laughs> yeah, okay. It's late in the day, so. I can answer questions about Nathan Mantel. If you'd like. <laughs> so a quick story about Nathan, because I just, because I can. Um, uh, so uh, he is my grandfather, and he used to, he's um, kind of, he's a mathematician. He's like a mathematician's mathematician. And he used to give us math problems when I was like five years old, six years old, seven years old. And during the holidays, he'd give us math problems, you know, as gifts. Uh, and he just come down and bore us to tears with math from I mean, it was my grandfather. So like, so, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> yeah. If you have no questions, I'm cool. Last chance. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to make a couple of announcements then, but first, yep. let us thank our speaker. Yep.